Hey boys and girls, I've been meaning to catch up with you for a while on this and you may be asking what's under the blue talk behind me. Well I'll tell you and we're going to make a quick little video about it and I got the autofocus turned off so you're not going to be like freaking out every time I move my hands. Alright so we have an army surplus generator under the blue tarp. It's actually called an MEP003. It's the bigger of the smaller army generators. From my research into buying my surplus army generator was that um, there's two. There's the MEP002 and then the 003. Okay, so the two puts out like 10 kW, um, where this one puts out like 20 plus kW. Uh, they, they're rated by the government. I believe for like 16 kW but they're way underrated because they're super overbuilt because they're like army generators they're made to like bring into the battle zone on a Black Hawk helicopter or big Chinook or something drop it off with a big bladder of diesel fuel and run like a like a mass unit like a first aid tent you know with cat scans and stuff like that or to run like the commanding officers tent you know where they figure out the battle plans and stuff like that or even run the freaking dishwasher at the kitchen you know at the army base but um but that's what they're made for you know they're army generators it's super overbuilt it weighs uh over 1200 pounds you know without even any fuel in it uh, forget about it. I mean, just to move it over here so I can make the video, I had to get my boy to help me. I got it sitting on a couple of dollies so I could actually roll it around. And, and I keep it stored in the corner of the garage like this, covered up with the tarp, yet I have the batteries. It's 24 volt. You know, as this video goes on, I'm just going to be like spitting out, you know, tidbits of information that I know about these uh army generators as we go along so pay attention so it's 24 volt uh, it takes two cross-wired uh, car batteries to make uh, 24 volts you know 12 and 12 so um, so it weighs a lot it's real heavy so I got it uh, under the tarp you know in the corner of the garage uh, safe but I have it turned so that I can get to the batteries which are disconnected and I told you I'm gonna be spitting out little bits of information they're disconnected um, but I could charge them individually because you don't want the batteries running down because then when you need it and there's a blackout you won't be able to like charge the batteries so uh, so I got a 12 volt charger there are 24 volt chargers available but I don't want to spend the 200 bucks to get a charger just for this so I got the batteries separated and I just keep them charging and then when I need it I hook the batteries and and hopefully it goes so alright so anyway um, it's the 03, the 003. It's really super rated, like over civilian usage. It's over 20,000 watts, like continuous duty. I mean, you don't have to worry about it. Um, it's a diesel. It's an air-cooled diesel. Um, it puts out about 70 horsepower, the engine, and then it, it kicks out, you know, 20 kW plus in the wattage. Um, what else? Okay, so diesel. You're asking yourself, you know, you want a generator. What do you want? Propane? What do you want? Gasoline? What do you want? Diesel? You know, you're asking yourself these things. So from what I figured out um, in my research, all right, so gasoline generators, they're fine, you know, if there's a good supply of gasoline. But as we, we on Long Island learned after Hurricane Sandy, for three weeks after the hurricane, there were gas lines, you know, five, six, seven, eight hours long. There were times when you couldn't get gas within, you know, reasonable even walking distance of your house. Um, and if you had no gas in your car, um, and, you know, you can't go drive 15 miles to go wait in line for seven hours to get gas. And besides those long lines, when you got on the end of the long line, by the time you got to the front of the line, the gas station was out of gas. So um, now gasoline, you might think, all right, great, I'll get a bunch of gas cans and I'll save, you know, uh, 50 gallons of gas in my garage. Number one, it's real dangerous because if, God forbid, one of those gas cans, something falls on it, gets a little hole and the gas falls on the floor, spark, you know, boof, there goes your house, 50 gallons of gasoline exploding. It's dangerous. 
Number two, um, gasoline uh, like kind of stinks, you know. All right, so don't worry about that. But but you can't store gasoline for long periods of time. I would say like two to three months in a can, even indoors, and the gasoline is sour. You know, six months, a year down the road, you try to put that gasoline in anything and start it up, you're going to screw up your carburetor, and you're going to have to, you know, take it all that stuff from scratch, maybe even have to bring it in for service, because you put gummy, old gasoline in your, what, your car, generator, whatever. So gasoline is not doesn't store well. Now you could say, all right, well I'll just watch the weather and when the big storm is coming, I'll get my 50 gallons of gas. And then if the storm goes past and nothing happens, I'll pour the gas into my car and use it up. And then I'll have the empty gas cans and I'll wait for the next storm. It's a good plan, but you know, we were 14 days in this house without electricity. So, you know, 50 gallons of gas, what is that? Like conservatively, not even running the generator all the time? Um, what is that, seven or eight days? All right, so you're still going to be sitting in a gasoline line somewhere. If the gas is even available after a tsunami, a hurricane, tornado, earthquake, you know, who knows what the hell is going to happen. Wildfires, you know. Um, it's crazy times, you know, end times, uh, prophecies, and um, um, zombie apocalypse, you know. It's right around the corner. Where every YouTuber knows the zombie apocalypse is coming. All right, so then you might look at propane. Propane is great. It lasts forever and ever. It, it is said that propane will last as long as the tank it's in. So you get a steel propane tank, you know, and the tank is rated for 50 years. All right, the propane's going to last 50. The propane will last as long as the tank lasts. Um, but a couple issues about propane is, uh, number one, you got to buy the propane tank. So whether you get like a 100 gallon tank, which is like this fat and like five feet high, you've seen them outside people's kitchens, okay? So you gotta buy those tanks. There's like 500 gallon tanks, which are like the size of like this thing, let's say. And then there are 1,000 pounders or gallons, I forget how they do it, but there's 1,000 ones and they're, they're pretty big. They're like 18 feet long, they're like four feet wide, looks like a submarine painted white, you know? Um, and usually those you bury under the ground or something, or you put them behind a house, something like that. Um, all right, so you got so you got to buy the tank. So let's say a 500, which is the you know one like this, like five feet high. That tank alone is like 1,800 bucks just for the tank. You know, then you have to have it plumbed to your generator, um, and uh, you got to get permits in most neighborhoods to have a, a huge propane tank like that. All right, forget about burying it. That might be another 2,000 bucks. So now you're looking at like 4,000 bucks just to get a propane tank buried in your backyard. All right, so, you know, propane is good, and also propane does run out. Now, around here on Long Island, during and after Sandy and the Nor'easter, because we had two storms within a week, you know, I'm telling you, the zombies are coming. So, um, I had people with 20 KWs, you know, not Army, but propane, like um, Generax or Kohler's or something, and... Uh, and they had the thousand gallon, you know, and they ran it 24-7. And eight days later, their propane tank was empty and their generator stopped. Now they call a propane company where they got their, uh, where they got their delivery from. Now the guy hasn't heard from them in four or five years since they first bought the tank and had it topped off. So uh, now the propane guys got regular customers, restaurants and houses. They call them every, week, every couple of weeks. So they're calling him. And now you're calling him who hasn't called him in four or five years, and, and his shortage is everything. He can't get gas for his trucks. Who's he going to deliver the propane to? You or the restaurant that he's dealing with for eight years straight? You're not getting propane. So the guy that ran out after eight days, for instance, the one, you know, I got plenty of stories of others, but him, it took him like a million phone calls, and he finally, like two days later, he got half a tank. Someone came, gave him half a tank of propane. Then he got real conservative with it, and he only ran it like, you know, uh, every couple of hours to heat the house up, and uh, um, yeah, very conservative. And, and he made that half a tank last for the rest. He was out like 16 days. He made that half a tank last. <laughs> he made that half a tank of propane last for the duration, but he got real conservative with it. So that's a couple of drawbacks with propane. Now we're looking at diesel. Okay. So diesel you can store for like uh, 
right out of the pump you can store it for maybe 18 months no issues you put a little diesel stabilizer in it which they sell at like boat stores and truck places diesel stabilizer additive okay now you're looking at maybe three to four years you can store diesel in a can somewhere now um, diesel is not as volatile as gasoline you can actually hold a match to a puddle of diesel and it will not turn into fire uh, it has to be like uh, sprayed or preheated and then it'll burn great you know so it's not as flammable so I don't worry so much about keeping you know 60 70 gallons of reserve diesel in the house waiting for the next uh, zombie apocalypse now um, secondly when the diesel does go bad which I have cans marked I think I have 70 gallons right now with diesel I got uh, 10 five gallon cans the yellow diesel cans and I have seven of them um, I have um, I have 70 gallons I have uh, 20 uh, cans I have 70 gallons filled uh, with additive sealed and labeled with the date and I have them next to my oil tank in the in the furnace room I told you I'm just gonna be spitting information out um, this is for the people on a need-to-know basis um, so that's sitting next to my oil tank when the time comes like three years down the road that I think I should rotate my stock of diesel the diesel goes in the home heating oil tank and my oil burner and hot water heater will burn that stuff up just like it was home heating oil that's the rotation process with the diesel then I'll fill the tanks back up and I'm good for another three years four years something like that now in the reverse say I run out of the 70 gallons of diesel you know now now this is another little thing I'm sticking in here the gas stations never ran out of diesel there was a gasoline problem on Long Island all the stations that sell diesel they had throughout as long as they had electricity at the station you could go buy diesel a lot of the stations didn't have electricity they weren't doing anything they would just shut but if they had power they were they had diesel no gasoline they couldn't get deliveries the roads were blocked power lines down big trouble getting the tankers into the terminals because the harbor was full of debris it was a whole nightmare all right but diesel wasn't a problem you could always get diesel so all right so then uh, alternatively the home heating oil which I have a, a 250 gallon tank in the basement that home heating oil is very similar to diesel fuel should I run out of diesel and not be able to get any diesel reason reasonably anywhere I have access to my home heating tank there's bung holes on the top of the home heating oil tank where the uh, vent goes out and where the, the line comes in when the guy comes with the truck then there's a third bung hole on screws very easily I've got one of those rotatable hand pumps that has a big stick at the bottom uh, with a hose on it and I can fill up my diesel cans add some two-stroke premix like you would use in a boat like an outboard engine or in a, a lawnmower or a backpack blower that additive so at a 50 to 1 ratio and then that home heating oil is fine to go in a diesel engine the diesel engines will even run on that heating oil without the additive but it's not that great for the fuel injectors because they need some lubrication qualities that they leave out of the home heating oil which the pre the two stroke premix would take care of that lubrication but you could run it without you know so in a super dire emergency I can run this thing on home heating oil you know and, and if it comes down to that and I have to go uh, you know uh, uh, loot the house up the block where the people abandoned you know there's gonna be heating oil around it's not it's not an issue it'll be around um, so uh, you know I told you I'm gonna be spitting information out and when it comes taking care of my loved ones if I have to go loot a house in a zombie apocalypse I'm looting the house you know um, I got p people I, I care about deeply and uh, people that I love and uh, if there's an empty house you know <laughs> I'm in there with my diesel cans and my little pump you know sucking that thing dry because they left you know they couldn't take it no more or you know, maybe they're dead the zombies got them I don't know all right so um so that's your three choices of fuel you know you make the decision um, now I, I got a really big I got this the MEP the other three I got this big one that will 
run the air conditioner, the washer and dryer, the oil burner, all the lights. I mean, it'll run my whole house. But it's loud and it uses like a gallon an hour, less uh, like 0.8 gallon an hour consumption. Then I got a smaller diesel, the Aurora. It's a smaller diesel. It puts out about 6,500 watts, which is great for like, you know, a couple of lights, uh, keep the oil burner going, um, uh, and uh, maybe a TV or something. Kids can watch a DVD, you know, while the zombies are wandering around the neighborhood. So, uh, so my plan is to use this during the day for like, you know, cooking the oven and stuff. We got electric stove, electric oven, um, air conditioning, a really hot day, do the laundry, you know, so we feel nice in the zombie. And at nighttime, I'll switch to the Aurora, which uses a lot less fuel. Um, I think it's like point, uh, I think it's like a half a gallon an hour compared to point eight. All right. So it's like almost half the consumption and it's a lot quieter. So it'd be nice at night. Um, plus, they back each other up because these are complicated machines. Uh, should one fail, you know, I don't, oh, I got an army surplus generator, and then it fails, you know, in the middle of the emergency, now I'm like one of those idiots without a generator. So they back each other up. Plus, I got a really small, I got a 1,500-watt gasoline generator that you may have seen uh, demonstrated in my uh, other YouTube video, How to Hook a Portable Generator to Your Circuit Box to power your whole house, you know? So I actually do have a, a very small gasoline generator, and I have two diesel uh, generators, but we're talking about the MEP-003 uh, today, so um, let's get back onto that. So that's my whole generator, basically my whole uh, theory, the modus operandi, uh, so to say, on the uh, uh, catastrophe, you know, natural or man-made or uh, um, disaster uh, slash zombie apocalypse that may hit anywhere at any time in the end times that we're facing uh, today. So uh, so let's uncover this thing and let's show you a little bit about it. Um, it's actually very interesting. It's like an engineering marvel, uh, if you ask me. Um, uh, a piece of uh, engineering artwork, uh, uh, I would venture to say. So let's show you a little bit about it and I'm actually going to start it up for you guys um, after we talk about it a little bit. So. Uh, you you want to be ready to, to get your generator into your home circuit panel. And like I said a minute ago, I do have a video up on how to backfeed. They call it backfeeding your generator into your circuit panel. And there's other videos how to backfeed too. It's not a big deal. But I got a grounding cable. Um, it's number six braided wire. I got about 15 feet of it. Um, it's very important that you ground your generators. I have number six two they call it six slash two which is like a I'll show you here it's like a three wire okay you got your white your black and you got your, your ground and that's all you need is is your white your black and your ground and I got 125 feet of this and the plan is is to run the generator here outside the garage door with the garage door closed um, and run this cable, I'll use about 70 feet of it over to my circuit panel and then backfeed at that point with this um, with this 70 amp uh, breaker. So uh, that's how we're going to backfeed the panel. Of course I would pull the main breaker to, to come off the grid, disconnect my house from the power lines because I don't want to feed my power back out into the grid. I want it all to stay in the house. Um, so that's that's basically how we, uh, the the hookup. So you want to be prepared for this. You don't want to be like scrambling around after the disaster trying to find what you need. You want it all ready. You want it all in one spot, and you don't want to have any trouble finding it. This here, ladies and gentlemen, is what they call a grounding rod. It's uh, I think about eight feet of copper. Uh, at, with a lug on it and this is where that bare grounding wire would go and the other end would come to the generator to one of the grounding lugs and an example of the grounding lug is right here okay so that's uh, fr uh, grounded the frame of the generator to the grounding lug in the ground and I'll give you a shot of that it's, it's right up against uh, the house it's not in anybody's way it's right there when I need it it's all pre-installed pre-staged and ready to go and again the generator would be about where it is now maybe move it out a little bit close the garage door and uh, that's where she would sit and uh, I don't have to worry about anyone stealing it because it's so heavy 
that uh, you'd need a crane to get it into any kind of truck. I'm not worried about that. Later came with the army uh, what they call uh, auxiliary fuel line and uh, so there's a fitting on the generator that this end goes in and there's like a pipe that, uh, <laughs> that this end goes in ah, I'm sorry I'm sorry about that freaking drop cloth but anyway so uh, it screws together Okay, and then this uh, could go in the oil tank, and uh, that generator actually has a fuel pump on it that will suck out of my home oil tank and uh, fuel the generator, so I don't even really have to, like, pump it out and then pour it in. It's got 25 feet, and I could extend it with any kind of fuel line and uh, actually, like, suck the diesel right out of a truck or a car or a 55-gallon drum or my own home heating tank. So that's a neat little thing about the Army generators. Here's a neat little shot of the uh, batteries. So we got uh, negative to positive, and then we got our uh, positive lead that comes to this terminal. And uh, let's see which one was that, was that one. And this is all, uh, this machine is mostly American tools, so uh, half inch uh, open end wrench. And there we go. Now we got 24 volts because we got uh, we got 12 and 12. Let me give my plug at this time. I bought this. Um, you can get them for like two grand at auctions, all right? But uh, at the Army government auction. But they're not tested. They're not guaranteed. They're not like checked over mechanically. They're just like Army surplus junk. You're really taking your chances. Um, Parts are kind of a little difficult to get because it's army stuff. It's not like over-the-counter stuff. So uh, parts are available on the internet, but like shipping, you know, you got to wait like three days. And in a disaster, who knows? But anyway, um, so I bought this from a guy called Green Mountain Generators or a company called GreenMountainGenerators.com. You could Google it. I promised them I'd give them a plug. Um, I paid about double over what you're going to get them for at auction, but... This came from an army contractor who rebuilds them normally for the army, does the service on them for the army. Um, so this one was completely gone over. From what I can tell, the fuel system was totally cleaned out. There's actually a lot of new fuel injector lines. Um, it's been load tested, it's been started up, it's been run. The fuel, everything cleaned out. It's got all new filters. Um, new batteries, all right, so it's basically a checked out, um, tested unit, and um, I actually had one problem with the starter, where the, uh, the starter solenoid, uh, because a, a little old and sitting in the sun, the plastic on the solenoid cracked like the third time I tried to start it, and uh, in like two days I had the replacement part uh, shipped to me. Uh, by this Green Mountain Generator. So uh, it does pay to like, um, as far as I'm concerned, to buy one of these that has been gone over from a company such as Green Mountain um, that, where you're not just buying army surplus stuff r like right out of the scrapyard. You're actually buying a working unit that has someone standing behind it. So that's my plug on that. Let's do a little walk around. So uh, here's the control panel, and what I like about it is all kind of stuff to play with. You got gauges and dials and switches and stuff. Um, this is like the throttle control. Um, there's all kinds of uh, heavy duty. Everything's like electric, magnetic, pulse uh, protected. You know, in case like a nuke goes off or something, the generator will still work. These are two outlets. Um, this is the main. Uh, uh, a circuit switch, um, there's a circuit breaker here, uh, let's see, what do we got here, the volt, this is the uh, increase the voltage, decrease the voltage, this is your voltmeter transfer switch, you got your panel light switch, uh, this is like the starter thing where you could preheat the glow plugs, we're going to do that in a second, or run your auxiliary fuel, or just prime and run, and then the start, this is the main uh, emergency stop breaker. You got your volt indicator for your batteries. Uh, you got your, um, your hours clock, and this one has 560 hours on it. This is your hertz. You want to pay attention. You're always at 60 hertz, and you can adjust that with the throttle lever. 
uh, your percentage of rated current that you're drawing, and your your AC volt outlet out, output gauge. So pretty cool stuff. There's a whole wiring diagram up here. Should it need field service? In here is where you're gonna hook that big cable I showed you. This is where the big cable goes on these lugs. Uh, and in this case, I would be doing this uh, 120, what would I be doing? This 120, 240 single phase. So I would be using L1, L0, and uh, L3. So I would, be, dun, 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 I would be hooking to that, you know, so that's pretty cool. More diagrams and stuff here. Um, everything's well thought out. I mean, this is like a super engineered... Uh, uh, super generator. Here's your fuel fill, big old thing. You can see it's full of diesel in there. And this is like a funnel slash strainer, so you don't get any crud in your fuel tank. So you actually like lift this up and turn it, and uh, and it locks in place. And then you would pour the fuel in there. And there's a very fine screen at the bottom. Filter out any sludge. It's actually got a gauge how much fuel is in it. Uh, these are the fuel lines and stuff. Uh, here's your air cleaner, and there's like a lever if it's cold weather, it would take intake air from the exhaust manifold to preheat it. In cold weather, it just sucks it right in through there. These are like veins that open up thermostatically for cooling. They work by themselves. I did this exhaust plumbing here to put this extra muffler on it to uh, quiet it down a little bit. There's our two batteries, that's the crankcase, there's the starter, the solenoids back there where they sent me the part for. Uh, this is the cooling fan down at this end here, I love the camouflage paint. It's got a big heavy duty frame it sits on, it's uh, got like tie down rings and a forklift could fit right in there and pick it up and stuff. Over here this is the oil uh, dipstick, uh, we got oil filters here, fuel injector lines. Uh, oil pressure gauge over here, uh, three fuel filters here for the diesel, um, these are my records, uh, service records I keep on it, uh, handy there, there's like rings to pick it up with cranes and helicopter slings and stuff like that, walking back around is our auxiliary fuel connection is over here, it's this little guy right here, uh, solenoid for that, fuel pumps, um, alright so that's the walk around. So let's uh, let's put the camera, lock it in place, and let's see if we can kick this baby over. Huh? What do we want to do? We got a good camera angle here in YouTube. That it's all in the camera angle. And uh, what I want to get is that smoke for you guys in the diesel. So here we go. <clears throat> We're going to. Oh, what I got? I got to push in that breaker. Okay, so there's my panel lights. The main breaker I had off. We're going to uh, preheat the glow plugs, uh, maybe for like 30 seconds or something like that. And that's what I have it on right now. We're preheating the glow plugs. And then what I understand is we're going to turn this to prime and run. And if we hear the fuel pump slowing down, that means it's prime. <laughs>
running time. The hurt. Percent of rated load. Our AC bolt outlet. Output. the generator's running outside. I just wanted to give you guys an idea of the noise level in the house and uh, it's not bad at all. Very low rumble. And that's like right above it there but if you walk down by the bedrooms you can't even hear it.